you may have heard that autophagy has many health benefits and it's going to help you live longer, reduce inflammation and promote general well-being. But how do you actually know if you are in autophagy and gaining all those benefits? In this video, I'm going to talk about how to measure autophagy. So check it out and click the like and subscribe. Let's quickly go through some of the basics. Autophagy is a metabolic process that makes cells dissemble and recycle their dysfunctional components. You're basically converting cellular debris and doing housekeeping through self-eating. Autophagy has many benefits on health, lower inflammation, stronger immune systems, suppression of cancer and tumor cells, removal of pathogens and toxins, improved mitochondrial functioning, better biomarkers and longevity. Autophagy is also directly linked to the increased longevity benefits from caloric restriction and intermittent fasting. Caloric restriction and fasting are one of the few known ways of activating autophagy and they're also one of the few known ways of promoting lifespan in other species. The entire process of autophagy and self-eating is called autophagic flux, which includes 1. the formation of an autophagosome, 2. fusion with lysosomes, and 3. the degradation of the autophagosome. Most of the measurements of autophagy are done in other animals, not humans, which is actually quite difficult to know how do these different metabolic pathways affect autophagy in humans. Damn it! To accurately estimate autophagic activity, it's essential to determine autophagic flux, which is defined as the amount of autophagic degradation. Basically, autophagic flux shows you how many cells are being recycled and how much of them get degraded. Monitoring autophagic flux is still complicated even in cultured cells and model organisms, not to mention humans, but the research we've done in other species can still give us a lot of insight into how these metabolic pathways work. Autophagy is regulated most by the mTOR and AMPK pathways. To trigger autophagic cell death, you need a catabolic catalyst that will increase AMPK and cause cellular stress. Being anabolic and growing will inhibit autophagy by raising mTOR through the insulin IGF-1 signaling pathway. The activation of mTOR inhibits the formation of autophagosomes by blocking the formation of ULK1. Likewise, if mTOR gets suppressed, AMPK gets raised which allows the formation of autophagosomes and then leads to the activation of autophagy. mTOR and AMPK are like the yin and yang of your metabolism that can't coexist, but they do balance each other out. Perfectly balanced, as all things should be. To know whether or not you're more anabolic or catabolic or more mTOR or AMPK activated, you can measure your insulin to glucagon ratio. Both insulin and glucagon are important for your body's homeostasis and survival. They will either make you store energy and repair vital tissues, which is anabolism, or break down backup storage so you would survive, which is catabolism. In general, an increase in insulin glucagon ratio is associated with more anabolism, weight gain, muscle growth, fat storage, hyperinsulinemia, and a higher risk of hypoglycemia. A reduction in insulin glucagon ratio promotes catabolism, fat loss, ketogenesis, and prevents hypoglycemia. A higher glucagon ratio is more likely to be accompanied by ketogenesis, the creation of ketone bodies, lipolysis, the burning of fatty acids, elevated AMPK, and therefore the potential for increasing ULK1 as well as autophagy. But on the other hand, if insulin is higher than glucagon, then that will already negate the possibility of autophagy because of insulin mTOR and other anabolic pathways. To know what's your insulin to glucagon ratio, you probably have to take a blood test at the doctors. But you can guesstimate your metabolic health as well as your insulin to glucagon ratio by measuring your glucose ketone index. The glucose ketone index is a number between the relationship of your ketones and glucose levels. It can help to monitor your general health in relation to your blood glucose levels. The glucose ketone index formula is this. Your glucose levels divided by 18 divided by your ketone levels. So here's how you do it. First, you measure your blood glucose by pricking your finger. Then you write down the number. Second, measure your blood ketones by pricking your finger again and writing down the number. Third, divide your blood glucose number by 18. If your device is using milligrams per deciliter, then dividing that with 18 converts it over to millimoles per liter. If your device is already showing millimoles per liter, then you don't need to divide anything and can skip this step. Number four, divide your result from the previous step by your ketone numbers. Number five, the end result is your glucose ketone index. In general, having a glucose ketone index below three indicates high levels of ketosis in relation to low levels of glucose. Three to six shows moderate ketosis and six to nine is mild ketosis. Anything above nine and ten is no ketosis. Therefore, a lower glucose ketone index will reflect an estimated insulin glucagon ratio 
by virtue of how glucose and ketones affect that relationship. These measurements aren't definitely indicative of autophagy or anything like that, but they can still give you like a glimpse into your general metabolic health and what kind of a state your body is in. Is it more anabolic or is it more catabolic? If you get a lower glucose ketone index while being in a fasted state, then you can predict that, okay, I may experience some mild autophagy already, because first of all, I'm fasting, which means lower mTOR and activated AMPK. And secondly, my incident to glucagon ratio is also lower. So all of the requirements for autophagy are met. You just have to make sure that you're not consuming calories, which is one of the critical parts of actually maintaining autophagy for longer. If you're consuming calories and you have a lower glucose ketone index, then it probably doesn't mean that you're in autophagy because you're consuming calories and you're raising mTOR, which kind of inhibits the formation of autophagy. Access denied. You can only use these numbers as a prediction for autophagy while you're fasting because that's the only way we know how to actually increase autophagy. For instance, during one of my 5-day fasts, my glucose ketone index was about 0.9. I hadn't been eating anything for 5 days. My blood glucose was low, my ketones are high, my incident to glucagon ratio was low. Then that's probably a good sign of deep autophagy. But if I had registered the same number while having eaten, then there's also this inhibiting factor that simply negates all of the possibilities of autophagy. So this is the way you could potentially predict how much autophagy you have activated in your body at a given moment. But to actually measure something accurately, then we don't really have something feasible in humans yet. It's not gonna be that important even because autophagy itself is only a one part of longevity. You don't want to be in autophagy all the time either because it will prevent growth and repair of your body. Too much autophagy may lead to muscle wasting and dysfunctional cell death, which is why you want to balance catabolism with anabolism and have enough mTOR as well as AMPK. So the idea is to reach a homeostasis between anabolism and catabolism, which is why intermittent fasting is one of the best things for keeping autophagy activated while still getting to eat and boost the other benefits of this anabolic state. You can now also get my new book on Amazon, Metabolic Autophagy, that teaches you how to balance and optimize these metabolic pathways, such as mTOR, AMPK, and autophagy. But other than that, thanks for watching this video. Make sure you click the like, subscribe, and notification bell as well. My name is Seem. Stay autophagic, stay empowered. God of Thunder. Access denied.